It's time, it's time to learn about brain. Hello! The topic of today's lecture is small networks. We'll be talking about what several neurons, if they're connected together, can do. And obviously several neurons connected together can do way more than any single neuron. Even though we have seen in the previous lecture, even a single neuron can do some computations. Some combinations, some small networks or network motifs, like little pieces of how neurons can be organized, are so popular that they even have their own names. And it's nice to go through these names just in case we meet them in the future. The most obvious one is the feedforward excitation network. It's this A number over here. When you have an excitatory neuron, excitatory neurons on this picture are green, connected to another excitatory neuron, or other bunch of excitatory neurons probably, that are connected to other excitatory neurons, and so on. And this is what most of the brain is, of course. Feedforward networks, where information propagates from one neuron to another, from one set of neurons, from one layer of neurons to another. The next combination that also has a name is called feedforward inhibition, where you have excitation, excitatory neurons, connected to inhibitory neurons. Probably GABAergic we are talking human brain. And inhibitory neurons inhibit the next layer of neurons. And if you don't yet know why this thing could be useful, just remember that it is possible. And actually, even within this lecture, we will have a case when feedforward inhibition will be used. The next one, the next pair of words, I guess, convergence and divergence, are about several inputs converging on one neuron or one neuron sending outputs to many neurons. Basically, these are two words, the meaning of which we could have guessed. Lateral inhibition is fancy and will be used a lot, but let's spark it for now because it's kind of weird to learn it without the system in which it is used. And the one that's really important is feedback or recurrent inhibition. When you have excitatory neuron that projects to another excitatory neuron, but then one way or another you have an inhibitory neuron projecting back to the original neuron. And this is perhaps the only one where I can ask you a question and actually expect an answer. When do you think this would be useful? So again, you have an excitatory neuron, is projecting to another excitatory neuron, but also you have an inhibitory neuron that projects back. This is inhibition. Maybe this one projects to it, or maybe this one projects to it, something like that. When this thing will be useful? What do you think? Maybe let's use our traditional way of designating questions. I will make a sound. Perhaps you recognize the theme, the, the motive. This is a case of negative feedback, because inhibition makes neurons spike less. And in this case, inhibition projects back, so any activity in this layer through these connections inhibits itself, which kind of shows why feedback inhibition may be used by the brain. Anytime you want a negative feedback to happen, so every time you want a bunch of neurons limit its own activation, that's when you would expect feedback inhibition to be involved. But today we'll talk about a particular neural circuit and a particular behavior, which will be a startle and escape behavior in a fish. Because it's a nice model, and the model that was actually studied and that nicely illustrates some of the core ideas of how you can combine a few neurons into this small network that are kind of understandable and that you can even try to reverse engineer in some cases. So let's see what's happening here. What is shown on this slide? What do you think? It's clearly underwater, right? But at the same time, these animals seem to be birds. What are birds doing underwater? Shouldn't they be flying in the air? These birds are hunting. You probably noticed that these are seabirds. These, these ones in particular are called gannets, and they fly above the surface of the water, but every now and then they see the fish down there, and then they climb higher in the air, and then they dive. And they dive at high speed, they break the surface of the water. See, they make these nice weird chimneys of bubbles. They dive pretty far, and then once they approach the fish, they try to catch it. And the idea is that you do it so fast that fish doesn't have time to escape. Probably the most famous bird who is doing that is the kingfisher. Here are three pictures of a kingfisher. But so what can a poor little fish do? Because this thing is really fast. Kingfisher, uh, when it breaks the surface of the water, is moving at about 10 meters per second. What can a fish do? The only thing it can try to do is to escape. And it's a peculiar type of escape, because it doesn't actually have to go very far. It's not about being able to swim fast, it's about being able to react quickly. 
it may be only enough to move by a few centimeters, because once the bird is underwater, its speed is dropping really quickly, so most probably the area in which it can catch you if you're a fish is where its neck can extend. Just a few centimeters may mean the difference between life and death, so it's better to quickly move by a little bit than slowly move really far. How can you do that? It turns out that fish, most of them, have this fast escape response. And here is a description of this response in a goldfish, I believe. The top few pictures are silhouettes from a video, high speed video, a thousand frames a second or something. On a normal speed video, you basically wouldn't see that because the response is so fast. For a normal frame video, this would be one frame. Everything basically happens within the length one frame. But if you shoot it at a high-speed video, you notice that there are stages to this behavior. At first, fish is standing stable, and then at some point it's bending in this C shape, and then once it's bent, it allows its tail to make a flip. So it moves its tail, and the fish ends up being turned by 180 degrees, as compared to how it used to be before the behavior started. So in just a few milliseconds it moved in the opposite direction and actually because of this tail flip it's moving in this direction. Just a few milliseconds after the stimulus the EMG can be detected and EMG is electromyography which means an electrical recording from a muscle. Myo stands for muscle. In just a few milliseconds the muscle gets depolarized which means that everything, all the neural processing happens in these few milliseconds, in the seven milliseconds or so for a goldfish. And stage one starts is when you can notice the beginning of this motion. And what's interesting is that the time delay between the depolarization of the muscle and the beginning of movement is actually longer than the time it takes the fish to detect the signal and process this information. So this delay between the moment when the muscle is depolarized and the fish started to move is something that you cannot get rid of. It's just the natural delay. The muscle cannot move, cannot start moving faster than that. But the neural process is so optimized that it happens faster than the beginning of the movement of the muscle. And just in few tens of milliseconds, the fish is basically done. So less than in a hundred of milliseconds, the fish is already fully turned in the opposite direction and moving at a reasonable speed, and it can later add some swimming motion to it. Here is an example of this process happening. Here you, we can see a battle of two animals. Do you know this monster? Can you recognize this monster? This is a dragonfly larva. Dragonflies are predators, aerial predators, but the larvae are famous underwater predators. So dragonfly lives as a killer insect in both halves of its life, when it lives underwater and when as an adult it lives above water. And here you can see the dragonfly is trying to eat this tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny newborn zebrafish. This zebrafish is probably about a day old or something like that. It's just a few hours after fertilization. You can barely see it. It's basically all eyes and tail. But even at this age, it already can escape from a dragonfly. So you can see dragonfly extends these snapping jaws or whatever the name of this organ is that it uses to catch stuff. But fish starts escaping and manages to escape. And this is filmed at a thousand frames a second, but shown to us at 30 frames a second, which means that it is about 300 times slowed down compared to the actual event. The actual event we wouldn't have even be able to see if we just stared at this petri dish with our naked eyes. It would have been instantaneous. But with a camera we can see that lots of drama is actually happening. In this case the fish wins. So can we try to reverse engineer the network that underlies this response? It turns out that we kind of can, so let's try to do that. I will be asking you questions, and for each question, just try to think what your answer would have been. Try to take a stance, try to provide an answer that you would have provided if you were in a real classroom. All right? And the first question is, if you wanted to create a network like that, the network that underlies an escape response in a fish, something that needs to be really, really quick. It doesn't have to be smart. It doesn't have to be super nuanced necessarily, but it needs to be fast. If you wanted to design a network like that, would you go with lots of tiny cells or one large cell? If you wanted to be fast and decisive, lots of tiny cells or one large cell, what would you prefer? I guess one large cell intuitively sounds more reasonable, right? 
let's have one large cell that is decisive. Indeed, that's what's happening. Fish have this giant cell called the Mouthner cell after the name of the person who discovered them in 19th century, although in recent years most people call it M cell just because Mouthner is too long. There are only two M cells in the fish body, so it's actually not quite one cell, but two, just because the fish has bilateral symmetry. There is one cell on the left and one cell on the right. And these are the largest neural cells in the entire fish body. In a goldfish, the cell body is almost a millimeter large, so you almost could have seen it. You probably cannot really see it with your naked eye just because it's transparent, but it's much larger than a typical neuron. And we can kind of see how having fewer cells in this case makes sense, because this response needs to be decisive. Having a lot of cells would probably be better if you wanted some sort of democracy, if you wanted different cells have different opinions and then you wanted to average these opinions, which is a good approach in, in some cases, but not in this one. In this one, we want a decision to be made quickly and then the result of this decision be powerful. So we would rather go with a few large cells rather than with lots of small cells. Next question, what be the main input for this cell? So when the fish escapes, what is the main sensory modality? What is the main sense that would help it when a bird suddenly crashes the surface of the water and goes down in this almost explosion of bubbles? What sense will be the most obvious one to use to detect it? And also we want the sense to be kind of fast. What would it be? Probably hearing is a good one, hearing and touch, right? Because vision is kind of slower and also you may not be able to see this bird too well, but hearing is good. And fish actually have another sense that's kind of in between touch and hearing, which is called the lateral line. So they have these sensitive cells in the ear as we do, but also they have similar sensitive cells in a special canal that runs along their body. And they use their cells to also detect the movement of the water around them. And the cells can be roughly drawn like that, so this is supposed to be a rendition of one of those sensory cells. And these cells connect to neurons and neurons connect to the mouth or cell. Good, so now we have the sensory part. And I will be drawing everything on only one side, but you can imagine that whatever I do there is always a similar system on the other side. Okay, where would the cell project to? Once it's spiked, so once we detected the a dangerous stimulus nearby and it's time to escape, where would it send its action potential? To muscles, right? To muscles on which side? Okay, let's see, you're a fish, that's a fish, uh, we're looking from above, so these are the eyes, and then something horrible happens over here. Where do you escape? You escape here, right? You bend like that into a C shape so that eventually you would swim in this direction. And to bend in a C shape, muscles on which side would you contract? On the same side as the stimulus or on the opposite side? To bend? You want muscles on the opposite side, right? So muscles over here would be contracted, which means that here we need the cell to project to the contralateral muscles. And that's indeed what happens. The Mouthner cell projects to the motor neuron, that projects to the muscle. And projects here means an axon grows too, and then there is a functional connection, right? The way vertebrates work, these large cells, these giant cells, never connect to muscles directly. Nothing connects to muscles directly except for special motor neurons, but this is basically as short of a circuit as we can go without violating the basic plan of vertebrate nervous system. The giant cell connects to the motor neuron, the motor neuron connects to the muscle. Now, next question. Muscles on the other side are contracted. What happens to muscles on the same side? We may want to relax them for two reasons. One, it's just easier to contract muscles on the other side if muscles on this side are relaxed. But a more important reason, the fish might have been doing something at the moment of the response when the kingfisher or the gannet appeared nearby. The fish might have been swimming and when it was swimming probably muscles were activated one after another. So by the time this response started there may actually be some ongoing background activation of muscles on the side that we want to relax. So now we really want to relax them so that these two processes, what the fish was doing before the escape started and what the fish is doing during the escape, wouldn't interfere with each other. 
So let's relax them. How can we relax them? Mm -hmm. One idea you may have is to inhibit the muscle because that's what inhibitory neurons do, right? They prevent the next cell from spiking. However, it so happens that in vertebrates like us or puppies or fish, there is no direct inhibition of muscles. All neurons that connect to the muscle are excitatory. In invertebrates, like flies, for example, muscles can be directly inhibited, but vertebrates don't do that. However, the general idea of using inhibition is a good one. So the best we can do is inhibit motor neurons that connect to the muscles. If we inhibit motor neurons, then we will relax these muscles as fast and as much as we can. And here's how it looks like. While the mouth inner cell projects to motor neurons on the opposite side, it also connects to inhibitor neurons that cross back to the original side and inhibit motor neurons. And if you remember those fancy words that we learned in the fancy words lecture, it means that the mouth inner cell excites motor neurons that are contralateral to it, but inhibits ipsilateral motor neurons. Okay, what's next? The next question is kind of fancy and it is harder to answer. How can we make it so that this network is fast, but at the same time so that it wouldn't be active all the time? Let me explain that. Look, this network obviously has some threshold. When a stimulus is not strong enough, it shouldn't excite the mother cell because the fish shouldn't be escaping from stimulus that are not dangerous. If another fish of the same species, like your friend, if your friend is swimming nearby, if there is just natural movement of the water, if you touched a blade of underwater grass with your body, it shouldn't make you escape. If you escaped for every tiniest, teeniest, tiniest stimulus, you would be escaping all the time. And if you are escaping all the time, then you don't have time for anything else and you obviously die. So the threshold for the escape response should be fairly high. The stimulus should be strong in order to frighten you, frighten you. But at the same time, this response should be very fast. And if you think of it, these two requirements are a little bit in a contradiction with each other. Because to make it fast, you want to make all synapses really strong. You want to be able to depolarize the postsynaptic cells really fast. But if all synapses are really strong, wouldn't it also make them respond to everything strongly? We kind of need a system that is hard to activate, but once it's activated, it should be very powerful. And it's hard to do with these synapses that we have on this picture alone. So we need to add something that would make it so that weak stimuli don't activate the cell, but stronger stimuli do. What can we do? And if you don't have a good answer, that's okay. This is a hard question, but let me tell you the answer. One solution, and that's the solution that nature uses, is to use feed-forward inhibition. Remember, we just discussed briefly feed-forward inhibition on the page with names for different fancy networks. And this is a case of feed-forward inhibition happening in parallel with feed-forward excitation. This part is feed-forward excitation. A hair cell, a detector cell from a lateral line or from the ear, excites postsynaptic neuron, that excites a mouth inner cell. But at the same time, in parallel with it, we have fit forward inhibition. An excitatory neuron excites an inhibitory neuron, and an inhibitory neuron inhibits the mouth inner cell. And the way I think about them, I make excitatory neurons warm and inhibitory neurons cold. That's my color scheme. Some people have it the other way around. On the first glance, this network arrangement feels a little bit weird. Why would you excite and inhibit the same thing at the same time? Like, what's the point? Why would you essentially encourage someone to do something with one hand while at the same time discourage them with another hand? Like pushing with one hand and pulling with another. Why would you do that? What's the point? It turns out that it's just a really good mechanism to create exactly what we discussed before. We can have a cell that is hard to excite, but when it's excited, the signals are all very strong. And the way you do it, basically imagine that this neuron, the inhibitor neuron, always has the same strength with which it tries to inhibit the postsynaptic cell. But this neuron, the excitatory one, excites the postsynaptic cell, the mother cell, the M cell, the stronger, the stronger is the stimulus. 
In this case, for weak stimuli, you will have weak excitation and this fixed, fairly strong inhibition. And inhibition will always win. But for strong stimuli, you will have really powerful excitation and same kind of inhibition. And so excitation will win. This would allow you to set the threshold fairly high. And it also comes with another funny consequence. By changing the strength of this inhibitor neuron, you can change the threshold for the stimuli that would evoke a response. And in real life, you probably, you certainly want to change the threshold a lot. Imagine that you're a fish and you're in the middle of a lake and nothing is happening. The weather is good, but then a day later it's raining and these drops of rain falling on the surface of the water create some constant noise. And then maybe it's windy and so there are waves on the lake. Or maybe as a fish you swim closer to a waterfall and near a waterfall there is this constant noise and still you want to find some food and do your fish things that fish do, whatever they do, fish in their spare time so depending on the situation you want the threshold for for responses be either high or low it's like being in a quiet room and being spooked by every sound or being in a loud environment somewhere in the middle of an airport if we respond to noises in the airport the same way we respond at our cabin in the woods at night we wouldn't have been able to even exist in the airport right we would have just collapsed on the floor so the same is true for the fish and the waterfall and the windy day we really need to be able to change the threshold at which the escape response starts okay good so far so good now we have a network that can make you contract your contralateral muscles that relaxes your ipsilateral muscles that is fast decisive and has a threshold for activation that is fairly high now how do you decide which side to actually contract so far we discussed this example when the fish is looking in this direction this is again the fish seen from above so the fish is looking there and then something happens on one side and we assumed that this stimulus may be a predator suddenly appearing. This movement of water excites one side stronger than the other and the mountain cell makes it so that muscles on the other side contract. Good, but what if the stimulus is just slightly over here, slightly biased, slightly on one side not directly in front of you but at the same time it also activates your ear and your lateral line on the other side of your body a strong enough stimulus would probably activate both sides anyways right what to do then how to make it so that this network could respond reasonably to a stimulus like that because you see we have a problem we really don't want both cells to be activated if both cells activate then at the same time you contract your muscles on one side but also you contract the muscles on the other side where do you go then nowhere if both sides are contracted it's a spasm. You just freeze in spot. You just do. Eh. You don't really bend. You cannot bend because the other side is not relaxed. So we should somehow change this network now so that only one mouth or cell would be activated. So let's think. The stimulus comes to both sides, but it probably reaches one side a little bit earlier and it's a little bit stronger on one side. So it's as if we needed to compare the strength of two stimuli. How to do that? How to compare the strength of two stimuli? A hint, we actually had a slide about that. Inhibition, right? Remember, if you have two sides and you want to compare them, you just have a neuron that's excited but by one side, but inhibited by the other side. And then this neuron will respond essentially to a difference of activation on the left and activation on the right. And that's what happens here. So look, because I'm only drawing everything on one side, it's a little bit iffy, but here's what happens. Each lateral line, each ear excites the, the ipsilateral mouth or cell, but inhibits both the ipsilateral and the contralateral mouth or cell. If this input is strong and this input is weak, we will have strong inhibition here, but weak activation, and this cell won't be excited. And if this input comes a little bit earlier, which it will, even better. Basically, whomever is excited stronger and whomever is excited earlier wins.
But now let's do a sense check. How quick is this network really? As we've discussed, the action potential takes about one millisecond to happen, but the synaptic transmission is about two milliseconds. And that's about the shortest you can go. Maybe it's even longer. Maybe it's even up to five milliseconds. And two milliseconds is a lot. Let's estimate. The Kingfisher goes at 10 meters per second, which means that in one millisecond, it does 10 millimeters and 10 millimeters is one centimeter. If the synaptic transmission is two milliseconds, it means that the bird trying to catch this fish will move by about two centimeters in that time. And that's almost an inch, it's like that much. It's quite a lot. If each synapse weighs two milliseconds, we are probably dead. What can we do? Do we have any tricks in our sleeve? Yep, and we talked about those electric synapses. Remember, they're not particularly tunable, they're harder to tune, they're slower to tune, but they are fast. And so, what we can do, we can try to use an electric synapse. These neurons form both electrical and chemical synapses on the mouth or cell, and they become exceedingly fast. The speed of transmission in electrical synapses, because it's essentially direct coupling of two cells, is measured not in milliseconds, but in microseconds. So it's about a thousand or a hundred times faster. But now we have another problem. Inhibition had just become an important part of this story, but inhibition is still chemical, while excitation is electrical, which doesn't make sense, because now inhibition cannot catch up with excitation, and everything that we said before doesn't work anymore. Excitation just does everything way too fast for the inhibition to catch up. What can we do? Now, this is a trick question, because it's really hard to imagine an inhibitory electrical synapse, but it turns out in this case an inhibitory electrical synapse exists. And I draw it as a rather fancy structure because it is a fancy structure. And we won't go into details because this is a very specific motive, specific for this circuit and for a fish brain. Electrical inhibitory synapses of this particular type don't seem to exist in our brains, for example. So we won't be talking about that. Let's just believe that it's possible to do. If you're interested, you can read about it in the paper. Next question. What else should we add to this network? What other potential problems may we have with it if we implement it like that? It turns out that there is one problem that we haven't addressed yet, and that's the problem of activating the mouth or cell more than once. Because you know what? We really don't want to activate it more than once. If the response is so fast, because remember, it took only 7 milliseconds to start activating the muscles, compared to the speed of signal propagation in this neural network, muscles are really slow motion, they're like, uh, it's like 10 times slower. Because of that, we really don't want to activate this mouth or cell while the previous response haven't yet finished. And actually, even after it was finished, we don't want to activate it. Because remember, by the end of this escape sequence, the fish was turned by 180 degrees compared to its original orientation. If we just start another escape response immediately after the previous one was over, the fish will just return to its initial position. And that would mean that nothing useful happened. Bon appetit, little bird which means that we need to find a way to inactivate this network after it fired. And you may think, oh well, action potentials already kind of come with this feature built in. There is a refractory period. And that's kind of true, but the refractory period is fairly short. It's only a few milliseconds, while we are talking hundreds of milliseconds. How can we make it happen? And we can start with a general statement. How do we inactivate cells? How to make sure that cells don't spike? Inhibition, right? So can we use inhibition here? Yes, we can. We can do feedback inhibition. Remember, feedback inhibition is the type of negative feedback, and it's so reasonable to use it here. We just make the mouth or cell project not only to motor neurons, but also to a whole bunch of inhibitor neurons that would project back to the cell itself. So every time the cell spikes, the signal goes here, but it also turns back, activates these inhibitory cells, and they make sure that the cell doesn't spike for the second time. And now the only correction to this picture is that we probably want to activate these feedback circuits from cells on both sides of the body. Because regardless of whether it was left or the right cell was fired, we don't want to fire either cell for a few hundreds milliseconds after. And that's basically it. This is the network. This network is enough 
to support the escape response that we've seen on the previous slide, and it works. We reverse engineer this network successfully. So now next question. Can we use this network as a useful model to answer more general questions? Questions that are not about fish. Questions about fish are also important for the ecology of fish, for the general idea about how to perform escape maneuvers. But can we generalize from this model? Can we use it as a model for decision making, for example? Does the fish make a decision here? What sort of a decision it is? What do you think? Think about it. And if you think of it, probably the answer is yes. Because the fish is making two decisions, actually. One is whether to escape or not, because the threshold may change depending on whether it's still weather or raining and windy. Whether other fish are nearby, whether you are close to a rapids in a creek or to a waterfall, depending on all these circumstances, the threshold for good reasonable escapes should be either higher or lower. This is a sort of decision making that's simple but not primitive. And also, you need to decide where to escape. And you can ask all sorts of questions. For example, what if the stimulus is exactly symmetric? Is it better to escape to the left or to the right? Are most fishes righties or lefties as far as these escapes go? Can you teach the fish mostly escape to the left and to the right? You can ask lots of interesting questions, even in a network and for a behavior seemingly as simple as this one. And here is a very interesting tangent. The fish tries to optimize its responses. When the stimulus is on the right, it escapes to the left and the other way around. When the stimulus is on the left, it escapes to the right. But the problem is that predators are generally smarter than the prey. Wolves are generally smarter than the sheep, lions smarter than gazelles, because they have better food and because one of the key ways of hunting is outsmarting your prey. And so, if you always escape in the same way, even if its way is optimal, sooner or later somebody may start exploiting that. And indeed, it turns out there is a snake, a fancy snake called a tentacled snake that lives in murky waters somewhere in Southeast Asia. It tricks the fish into escaping right into its mouth. So, the way it works, the snake positions its head in front of the fish, then it quickly moves its neck here, and the poor little fish escapes right into the snake's mouth. It begs the question, can the fish still outsmart the snake if the snake is trying to predict how the fish can move? It turns out that the correct answer is your best way is to become unpredictable. And fishes try to escape not optimally, but unpredictably. And to be unpredictable, you acquire special neurons in your body that just generate noise. The object in which it was studied are those moths that try to pretend to be a dead leaf when hit by the ultrasound wave from a bat. It turns out that these neurons in the moth don't just make them stop fluttering their wings, but they make their movement really unpredictable. Because moths have neurons, they just fire all the time spontaneously. They generate noise. And when moths are hit by the ultrasound wave, their motion becomes unpredictable. If moths tried to optimize its escape maneuver, the bat would have manipulated it. But by behaving unpredictably, the moth forces the bat to try to react to its movement. And reacting to the movement is always harder than manipulating someone. And this is interesting from the philosophical point of view, because if you think of free will, if you try to define free will phenomenologically, which is a fancy word for how do you know free will when you see it, if you ask a person how can you tell whether someone has free will or not, they will probably answer something like when they can act out of their own volition, when they can act not as a response to something that comes from the outside, but kind of randomly. It almost feels like an ability to be unpredictable is one of the things that we tend to associate with free will. And while two first escape circuits that we considered, the escape circuit in a crayfish, remember, where we just had electrical synapses, and now an escape circuit in a fish, they both looked kind of optimized but deterministic. You can predict where the fish would go depending on where the stimulus comes from. But it turns out that real escape circuits are often more complicated than that because they have noise not just being there as an annoyance but deliberately built in by incorporating neurons that spike spontaneously. And that makes behavior of the prey unpredictable because unpredictable prey is harder to catch, it cannot be manipulated. 
And that's interesting because it means that if you define free will, and I'm sorry for spoiling it, I wish we could have a conversation about that and come to the conclusion together or have several nuanced versions of this conclusion. But basically my take on it is that if we define free will as an ability to be unpredictable, then it only takes one neuron, especially tuned neuron, a neuron with a fair amount of spontaneous activity, but one neuron nevertheless to satisfy this requirement and you can make different conclusions from that, but I guess let's park it. Next, an interesting question is, are there any practical applications to that? We just talked about the general theory of escaping, and before that we talked about escaping in fish, which may be important for fish scientists. But if you're a human scientist, if you're studying animals mostly because you want to help humans, can this behavior be useful in some way? And it turns out that there are ways to use it for practical purposes. So let's see one option that we have. And let's start from a little bit afar. Stimuli that are scary. This is a series of pranks where a snowman would stand and the snowman or snow person perhaps, this snow person would be just standing there like a sculpture. So people would not pay much attention to it, but then it would suddenly move and people would freak out. What's interesting here is that obviously if you have seen this snow sculpture move before, it's no longer scary. It's only when it's unexpected that it's scary. If it's expected, then you basically don't care that much. And that's interesting. The same stimulus can be scary or not, depending on whether you encountered it before. The second motion is less scary than the first one. That's what we can try to model. The way people study that, they either deliver one stimulus, like a sound or a tap that would normally make a fish jump on its place and perform an escape maneuver, or you do two taps, and the first tap is kind of weak, and it immediately precedes the second tap. So it's either one or two. Interestingly enough, and kind of unexpectedly, two stimuli, even though it's more sound overall, like in total, it's two, it's not one, two stimuli produce a weaker response. You need to kind of tune it down a little bit. So the first stimulus, the pre-pulse, should be weak enough not to produce a response on its own. And the second one is strong, but so a weak and strong is less scary to a fish, like scary goes in heavy quotation marks. But two stimuli, a weak and a heavy, produce a response with a lower intensity than one stimulus. So it's kind of like with this snowman. How does that help? It turns out that if you measure the amount of decrease between one stimulus and two, this amount is different in people who are not having a mental problem at the moment and people who have schizophrenia. People who have schizophrenia don't have a lower response to a double stimulus. They respond to a double stimulus the same way as they respond to a single stimulus. And this is shown on this plot. So control subjects, which in this case means people without schizophrenia, respond to a single stimulus like that. This is the basic response. It says zero, but it is that's because we're looking at some arbitrary units. So they have some response. But then as you start introducing two stimuli and as you change the delay between the first stimulus and the second, this is what's shown on this axis, the response decreases. For about a hundred milliseconds delay between the pre-pulse and the pulse, their response is lower than it would have been for a single stimulus. So again, this is the response to a single stimulus, this is the response of control people to a double stimulus, and it is lower. But in people in, with schizophrenia, which are shown in black markers, it's flat. There is no decrease as you introduce a pre-pulse. But then what's even more interesting, if you give them a medication that improves their symptoms, other symptoms, like real schizophrenia symptoms, their responses also become closer to that of control people. And this phenomenon has nothing to do with schizophrenia per se, in the sense that it doesn't underlie any of the symptoms of schizophrenia. This doesn't bother patients. That's not what bothers them. But two things are interesting. One, you can measure it. Because most thing about schizophrenia you cannot measure. You can only talk to a person and rely on their reporting, their own experiences. But the other thing, it's nice that this almost a neurological symptom follows the same pattern as psychiatric symptoms. When psychiatric symptoms get better, 
because people receive the medication, this neurological symptom also gets better. And on its own, this wouldn't help that much. Like that's interesting, but that's not necessarily a breakthrough. But now if we combine these two facts that fish can escape and that people with schizophrenia respond to double taps differently than people without schizophrenia, we can make something out of it because we can test whether a fish has the same property like responding to double taps weaker and indeed it does fish have prepulse inhibition and what's even more interesting if you give them a medication that produces psychosis in humans and that can be used to mimic the symptoms of schizophrenia the response decreases but if you give them haloperidol which is one of the medications that's given to people with schizophrenia to stop the psychosis, the response increases back. So the logic of how prepulse inhibition works in a fish is similar to the logic of how prepulse inhibition behaves in a human. Not behaves, but changes. And while fish cannot have schizophrenia, that's an important point. Schizophrenia is a human disease. Fish cannot have schizophrenia. Flies cannot have schizophrenia. I'm not sure about dogs, but fish cannot. However, what we can do once we have fish, we can, for example, use it for drug screening. These are again newborn zebrafish. Remember, we had them fighting dragonflies in one of the videos before. And they're tiny. They are ridiculously small. But they're cheap. You can have hundreds of them, thousands of them. And you can track them automatically. Here they're colored because it's from a paper where people develop a system, artificial intelligence, like machine learning kind of tracking system, that looks at all these fish. And for each fish, it identifies the first segment and the second segment and the third segment of this fish, and then measures the angles between these segments. And then you can startle them and see how they move and measure the angles at which they turned. And then because you can get so much data so quickly, you can make all sorts of interesting statistics analysis about it and again on its own the statistical analysis may not tell you much but then if you compare between two groups of fish suddenly you can use it as a readout what does it mean it means that you can have a bunch of fish and learn how they're startled but then you can add something that in humans causes a psychosis and now they get startled differently and then you can start adding different drugs and just see whether any of these drugs would fix the fish would rescue the official word for that would rescue the phenotype this is how it's called which means would recover the original normal response and now you can screen hundreds of these drugs hundreds of new chemicals and maybe some of them will work and maybe then you check okay so they work in a fish in this particular situation which means that they're promising it doesn't mean that they will immediately be helpful but at least it can be used as the first screen to identify a group of chemicals that may be promising and then you may start testing them in other models and looking more carefully into whether they may be helpful. That's it. This is a picture of a motor cell from a really old publication from 1950s, which I like. Thank you. See you later. It's time, it's time to learn about brain.